Good evening. Um, I'm Julia Tulovsky. I'm curator of uh, Russian and Soviet Nonconformist Art here at the Zimmerle. And it is my uh, pleasure and honor to welcome you all uh, tonight to a lecture, The Origins of Soviet Art by Vladimir Paperny. And this lecture is in conjunction with the exhibition, uh, Komar and Melamid, The Lesson on History, and the reiteration of it, Komar and Melamid in America, which is on view at the Zimmerle Art Museum until February 4. So um, if you haven't seen it, please um, take a look before it closes. And um, uh, without further delay, I'm going to introduce our um, uh, lecturer today, and uh, uh, we'll give the floor to um, Dr. Papierny. Uh, Vladimir Papierny graduated from the Stroganov Art Academy in Moscow with MA in Design. He received his PhD in Cultural Studies from the Russian State University for Humanities, and his thesis, Architecture in the Age of Stalin, Culture II, was published in a Russian, English, Czech, and Italian, and the French edition is scheduled to come out the next year. Uh, he moved to the United States in 1981 and uh, was a visiting professor and lecturer at UCS, uh, USC, UCLA, uh, Bristol University in UK, and other American and European universities. He has received grants and stayed at the Cannon Institute of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in 1984 and 2008. And in addition to his teaching and writing, both academic and fiction, he continues to work as a designer and filmmaker. And now I'm um, going to give the floor to Dr. Paperny. After uh, his lecture, we will have Q&A. So please, if you have questions, uh, use the Q&A button at the uh, bottom of the screen uh, to type your questions, and we will um, discuss uh, this topic after Vladimir's lecture. So please welcome Vladimir. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Julia, for your uh, kind uh, introduction. I'm, I'm very honored uh, being here. Uh, at this uh, great exhibition uh, which I, I have seen. And um, I want to say a few words uh, about my presentation. It's called The Origins of Sots Art. Uh, and that means that I will not be talking about the place of Sots Art in the history of art, in, in the theory of art, or anything like this. So if any uh, of you are interested in, in this uh, subject, I strongly uh, recommend uh, getting uh, uh, this book, uh, a beautiful and uh, very important book uh, uh, published by, uh, by the Zimmerle, um, uh, edited by uh, Julia, uh, with very uh, serious and interesting texts by uh, Maura Riley, by uh, Julia Tulowski, uh, uh, but uh, Mikhail Yampolsky, uh, uh, Yuri Albert, and, and, and many others, uh, interesting uh, uh, and very uh, serious uh, analysis of the place of art in the history and theory of, of art. But, um, I would like to start with a, a short five and a half minute uh, film, uh, uh, <clears throat> which um, I made uh, from my interviews with uh, Alec and Vitalik uh, very soon after their uh, separation or their divorces, as they call it. And uh, let's, uh, it will be a good introduction in, into the, the subject. So let's uh, see the, the short movie. Художники Виталий Комар и Александр Меламид известны как изобретатели соцарта. Но кроме соцарта они изобрели еще много других направлений в искусстве. Некоторые критики считают их первыми концептуалистами. 
Они научили обезьяну фотографии, а слонов – абстрактной живописью. Вспомнив советскую формулу искусства принадлежит народу», они провели опрос общественного мнения и написали любимую картину американского народа. А потом повторили это в других странах, включая Россию. Нечто похожее они сделали с музыкой. То, что мы слышим сейчас, это тоже созданное путем опроса самое неприятное музыкальное произведение. Они любили повторять, мы не два художника, а один. Даже усы и бороду они поделили пополам. Меламиду достались усы, а комару – борода. И вот несколько лет назад все кончилось. Что случилось с художником комара Меламид? Почему он больше не существует? Ну, я не хочу тебя сравнить с Битлзами, конечно, и так далее, но это нормальное сочетание, когда есть какой-то союз, так сказать, mm -hmm. он имеет, так сказать, начало и конец. Я думаю, мы сделали все, что мы могли. На самом деле мы уже стали буксовать, то, что называется, и ничего, в общем, так сказать... Нет, не то, что мы делаем что-то, или я делаю что-то сейчас оригинальное, но на всем случае есть возможность что-то изменить, так сказать, возможность пойти, так сказать, другим путем. Конечно, в каждом, в каждом разводе очень много причин, я повторяю. Там были и материальные, и духовные причины, много, много все это переплелось. Но если бы мы сами не осознали вот эту вот потребность начать работать отдельно, это редкий шанс вообще. Почему вы начали работать вместе? Что, собственно привело вас друг к другу. Это получилось естественно, и мы страшно были довольны, вот как все это повернулось, особенно в первые годы, когда все это пошло, все это было невероятное открытие. В каком смысле это вообще новый персонаж был? Он именно этот был персонаж, это создание некого третьего. Это было создание течения, течения как персонаж. И поразительно, что это удалось. Давайте посмотрим, чем занимаются сейчас два новорожденных художника Александр Меламид и Виталий Камар. Я бы хотел вернуться к тому пониманию духовного искусства, которое было у Кандинского. На самом деле Кандинский до сих пор не понятый художник. Во-первых, он был, он очень близок был к Теософии с его учением о смешении всех религий. Я начал тему, связанную с, вот, с моими мамой и папой. Это было связано в моих работах, как переплетались в нашей семье вот, э, э, иудаистские и христианские традиции, потому что отец был из христианской семьи, а мама из еврейской семьи. И просто я попробовал делать целую серию, понять создание экуменических символов. Я сделал такой утопический проект, что не коммунизм, а экуминизм. В этом проекте символы создавались из образов мамы, папы и меня, когда мне было 6 лет, когда был их развод. Я просто перестал заниматься, потому что я понял, что это стыдно. Стыдно, как-то стыдно просто, стыдно. Потом я понял, что у меня выхода нет, что я уже что, во-первых, надо зарабатывать деньги. Значит, чем я могу за? Значит, все-таки надо что-то рисовать, надо что вообще как-то надо жить дальше. Я все время думал, что я пророк, что я новый пророк, что Бог меня послал в жизнь для того, чтобы открыть миру истину. Но теперь я понял, что я не пророк, а что я Бог. Я есть Бог. Mortal who is more eternal than the immortals. Not only man God, but to God and God done. В этом месте у всякого нормального человека должна поехать крыша. Что это было? Меламид человек известный своим остроумием, так что это, наверное, пародия. Но на что? Впечатление такое, что после развода, так сказать, художники стали двигаться в противоположных направлениях. Виталий отбросил всякую иронию и стал совершенно серьезно говорить о духовном искусстве, а Александр, наоборот, ушел в такие дебри иронии, где уже непонятно, на чем он, собственно, иронизирует. Мне, пишет он на своем сайте, разумеется, по-английски, явились два ангела, которые заговорили на непонятном языке. Один из них произнес. Смерть художника по имени Камары Меламид, как это обычно бывает, резко подняла цены на его старые работы. Виталий Камар продолжает работать с галереей Рона Фельдмана в Нью-Йорке. Александр Меламид связан с аукционным домом Филлипс Дюпюри. И вот совсем неожиданный поворот. Он недавно открыл в Нью-Йорке нечто среднее между церковью 
и лечебницей по исцелению. Um, uh, well, uh, now I would like to go back uh, quite a few years ago um, uh, uh, when I w decided uh, that I wanted to uh, join the Stroganov Art Academy. Uh, and uh, I, I had some minimal training in drawing and painting through the Pioneer Palace uh, that was located in, in the church uh, across the street from the building where I lived. But uh, uh, instructions there were on, on a very low level and uh, what I learned there wasn't uh, enough for the entrance exams at such serious uh, place as Sroganov Art Academy, um, because it was the university level uh, art school. So um, I, I knew uh, Alec Melamid uh, since uh, he was probably eight and I was uh, maybe nine or 10, I was a little older. Uh, and uh, at some point his parents and my parents lived in, in a um, summer resort on, on the Baltic Sea in, in one of those uh, Baltic so-called republics. It was either Latvia or Lithuania or Estonia, I don't remember which one. It was very uh, 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 traditional for the, in, the Soviet intelligentsia to spend uh, summer or some vacations in, in one of those Baltic states because it was the closest thing to Europe even though it was a part of the Soviet Union, but still they had certain uh, European traditions and, and, and customs. Uh, so um, my parents and Alex's parents uh, had uh, rented houses uh, not far from each other in one of those Baltic republics. And I was visiting uh, them. And um, uh, Alex at that time was already a, a very serious uh, uh, artist. He was constantly painting. Uh, his room uh, in, in this uh, summer place was all covered with uh, landscapes and, and still lifes, and, and he was very serious about art. Um, so uh, since we, we knew each other, uh, when I decided that I want to apply for the Stroganov, uh, my parents said, call Alec. Uh, he already uh, first year student, so he, I'm sure he will not refuse to give you a, a couple of lessons. So I called Alec and I said, will you give me a lesson, a drawing lesson? He says, oh, sure, uh, come over. So um, I came to their uh, apartment. He hauled out uh, this uh, huge, uh, one second, uh, this huge uh, statue of, uh, uh, Socrates and said, uh, you will be drawing this uh, guy. Uh, and first he said, I will have to teach you how to attach a, a large sheet of drawing paper to the piece of plywood that I have. Uh, at so he, he bought, brought this uh, piece of plywood, uh, a piece of paper and went to look for um, some push pins. Uh, couldn't find any pushpins in, in the whole apartment, but found uh, a bunch of uh, wood screws and he and and a hammer. And he started hammering wood screws uh, into uh, uh, plywood to attach this uh, piece of paper. It was completely insane. And uh, I knew that it's not going to work. It wasn't going to work because uh, in addition to some drawing classes, I attended uh, another class at the Pioneer Palace that was called Skillful Hands, Umele uh, Ruki in Russian, where I was taught some basic um, handyman uh, stuff. And I, I definitely knew how to attach wood screws to plywood, uh, for sure not with, with a hammer. 
And the fact that Alec didn't know that, and, and he started uh, hammering them, and they were bending. And the Julia, you yes, read me. Hello? Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> then uh, I, I was uh, looking at uh, uh, Alex's effort with uh, believe it or not, with, with a lot of admiration. Uh, because at that time, I thought that uh, an artist has to be purely spiritual and he, he should not possess any uh, handyman uh, skills. Uh, it's, it's completely opposite of spirituality. Uh, so I thought he was a real artist because he couldn't uh, uh, hammer nails into plywood and I could. Uh, and I realized that I will never be uh, an artist, and, and I never became one, uh, really. Uh, surprisingly, uh, Alec managed to attach uh, this piece of paper to the piece of plywood uh, with some damage to both, but somehow it worked. And then uh, he started the, the lesson, and, and he said the, the following, um, I will show you how to make your drawing really beautiful. Uh, first, you create the outline uh, of, of the sculpture. After you create it, uh, look carefully, and you will see uh, in, in the sculpture different shades of gray, from the darkest gray to the lightest gray. And uh, then on your piece of paper, you outline those areas with a very thin, pencil lines, uh, and maybe you could uh, find like six, five or six shades of gray. And after you outline each area, you start uh, filling it with uh, pencil strokes, uh, start with the darkest and then lighter and then lighter and lighter. So it would be some kind of almost stained glass kind of a picture. Now, I never heard of such uh, idea of, of a drawing, neither before this lesson, neither after. The, it, it never existed. It was pure improvisation by, by Ali. And uh, it's very consistent with what he said later. Uh, he said, our, I saw our objective and our task uh, in creating at least four different artistic movements each year. So uh, we never wanted to stay in one place. We, we wanted to be constantly move, moving. And uh, this uh, improvisation about this very strange uh, idea of drawing um, gypsum uh, bust uh, was, was clearly uh, another attempt of creating something completely new. Um, uh, <clears throat> what's uh, interesting is that um, uh, I uh, eventually uh, was that I passed the entrance exam. Fortunately, I didn't want I didn't use uh, Alex's uh, technique because I realized it was some kind of a uh, intellectual game. Uh, and, and if I did, I, I'm sure I, I would not have pa passed the exam. And I was already um, a first year student, and Alec was the second year student. And uh, Vitalik was at that time at the army, uh, temporary at the army, and then he came back to the, the Stroganov a little later. So I, I met, met him next year. And um, for the first, for my first winter vacation, and Alec's second, our parents jointly rented uh, a cottage outside of Moscow, uh, 20, 30 miles uh, from Moscow, in, in a very beautiful place, a very nice uh, looking cottage, very, very big, just for two of us. And uh, next to this cottage was uh, some kind of a canteen or a cafeteria. Uh, and uh, my parents arranged with this cafeteria, they paid them to feed us. Uh, they prepaid for, for the whole two weeks so we could go there for breakfast, dinner, and, and, and supper. Uh, 
we liked the place, but it was kind of boring. Just the, the two of us in, in this huge building and it had a telephone. So we started calling our friends. Uh, and uh, in about two days, there were about 20 people living in, in this cottage. And it was very exciting because uh, half of them were my friends, uh, half of them were Alex's friends. But then within two weeks, we all became friends. Uh, very interesting, smart people. There, there, there were two mat mathematicians, uh, one philosopher, one musician, uh, one uh, architectural historian, quite a few artists. Um, very nice uh, company. We had a great time. Now, uh, one of, of this group taught us a uh, very strange uh, kind of a guessing game. Uh, it was called uh, Gob Dop. I, I don't know what it means. It probably means nothing. But uh, the game works like this. There is a um, there is a long table. On one side of the table, uh, there is one team, and on the other side, there is another team. Uh, when the other team, the, the guessing team, says "gop dop," our team, uh, where one of us would have a coin uh, in his palm, we'll uh, say one, two, three, and we slam our hands on the table in such a way that uh, nobody sees where the coin is. And then this guessing game starts. Uh, uh, the, the other team cannot touch our hands and cannot touch anything, but they can answer, uh, ask questions uh, and start very interesting uh, intellectual guessing game kind of a uh, guessing fight uh, and we're trying to mislead them of course for example if i don't have uh, a coin in in my hands i would be faking nervousness and uh, my eyes would, would be shifting so i will be pretending that i'm hiding something and they will say ah okay you have the coin. And I said, ah, I don't. So I, I won this guessing uh, the, the first route. So the next time, uh, let's say I do have a coin, but I would say, oh, I, I will still fake nervousness because then they know that I do it when I don't have the coin. But now I will show the same behavior but i now i do have a coin so uh, that would be a different rank of uh, uh, communication now uh, what is interesting is that at, at approximately the same time um, mathematician and, and philosopher uh, vladimir lefebvre uh, published uh, a book called uh, conflicting structures um, uh, and it was a very influential book where he described uh, those guessing games but uh, on a much more complex level in 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 our game there were only two possibilities you have the coin or you don't have the coin uh, and uh, i show you two different levels and and the uh, favor called those levels ranks of reflection so the, the the most primitive one at the rank one two three and he was analyzing a much more complex situation for example military conflicts uh where the rank of reflection could go to 20 30 whatever and um, this uh, uh guessing game uh with our gob dop uh conflicting structures that Lefebvre described, they all have something in common. They all have something to do, uh, something similar to uh, the game of, uh, uh, how it's called, uh, a game of, uh, 
for that what is called uh, uh, in Russian it's Napersky. It's a game of uh, uh, let me see. Whatever. Uh, the, the game looks like this. Uh, this video doesn't work, sorry. But uh, that's not important. Uh, why I, I'm talking about this uh, 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 game of, uh, uh, let me find the exact name. Uh, it's called the game of, no, I don't see the name. Uh, in, in Russian, it's Napersky, and, and the people who play this game, they're Napersky, and uh, in, in every uh, open A markets, there are always a lot of uh, rooks who are, um, invite people to try to guess, and they uh, have some tricks, uh, and they um, make a lot of money. Uh, the reason, uh, I, I think, uh, it kind of relevant to uh, what Sots Art was doing because um, what they were doing with the government and with the official ideology was similar to this uh, game of uh, three different, uh, let's say three different cups, or it could be four different cups, it doesn't really matter. And here's uh, one example. Uh, here is one example, uh, which is uh, the painting uh, that uh, was called uh, Solzhenitsyn uh meeting with uh, Heinrich Böll, uh, the famous German writer, at the dacha of uh, Rostropovich, the famous uh, Soviet musician. Uh, now, uh, that was the time uh, when so this computer kind of behave, behaves uh, unpredictably. Um, uh, at that time, the idea was uh, that every painting should be a combination of different painting styles. And uh, this is a good example. This is the uh, stained glass. This is the Soviet uh, Stalinist style uh, red uh, curtain. Um, now, this is pure cubism on, on the table. And uh, there are some other styles on, on, on those pants and so forth. Um, uh, uh, so when I saw this uh, picture for the first time in, in, in their studio, uh, they explained me the, the symbolism, why uh, it uses uh, all styles of uh, painting styles of, of uh, the world. And... Uh, so this is a, a purely a political painting. Now, <clears throat> about two months later, I walked in, into the same studio, and uh, I, to my surprise, Solzhenitsyn's head was removed and replaced uh, with the head of the chief editor of this magazine called Novy Mir, New World, uh, the famous Soviet poet, Alexander Twardovsky. And I said, uh, what happened? Where is the Solzhenitsyn's head? And uh, Alex said, well, uh, we have to be careful because Solzhenitsyn is now uh, the enemy of the people. Uh, we, we don't want to push too hard because it could be dangerous. So we uh, put Twardovsky instead of Solzhenitsyn. Uh, and it's, a smissel doesn't change, but it's, it's not as... Uh, Aggressive. Okay. So then uh, 
A month later, I was there again. And to my surprise, Solzhenitsyn head was back uh, in its place. And I said, Arik, what happened? Why, what's this gay game about? And he says, well, well, we uh, decided that it's time to become a little more aggressive. So it's the time is right to be uh, a little more daring. So to me, uh, there is some connection with this game of uh, um, thimbles. Thimbles are called these uh, caps. The game of thimbles, uh, where the, you uh, something always hide something and, and you don't know what you're going to find and where you're going to find it. Mm, and in, in a sense, it would be applicable to uh, the full history of Sotsart. Because uh, the, the whole history of Sotsart could be seen through the prism of this uh, game of uh, uh, thimbles. Uh, it was a constant play uh, of guessing with the government, uh, with the official ideology. For example, uh, the official ideology was against any kind of modernism, and uh, they wanted, um, they were fighting with abstractionism, with uh, avant garde. And uh, uh, the sorts artists uh, were using all kinds of technique they used, they could paint as, as Rembrandt, they could paint as uh, a, a cubist artist. Uh, they just demonstrated the, the they can, the, you cannot catch them if you say that they are avant-garde said, no, 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 we're realists, look at this red uh, curtain on, and so forth. So. Uh, and that I think it, it's very interesting, even because from the point of view of this guessing games described by Vladimir Lefebvre, it was the, the same uh, uh, time period, the same uh, era, and uh, the, the same kind of a, a mental and cultural uh, climate. Now, uh, Vitali. Uh, uh, I met Vitaly later because he was in the army, <clears throat> and when he came back, the first time uh, I saw Vitaly, he was going up the stairs at Stroganov, carrying some really beautiful, very large uh, canvas with uh, either oil or acrylic painting, but it looked very uh, old. It was, I thought it was Rembrandt or somebody from this area. And I said, what is this? And he said, oh, uh, it's my work. So, oh my God, it's it's amazing. And he said, yeah, but I gave, they gave me an F, failing grade. And I said, why? And uh, he explained and he said, you know, all our art teachers here at Sroganov, they are fairly old. And in the 20s, they all were followers or, uh, of Cezanne. They were all Cezannists. Uh, and then uh, in the 30s, uh, everything required to be socialist realism. And they really hated it, but uh, they didn't have any choice. They became socialist realist, uh, our teachers. But as soon as the, there was a little bit warming up, uh, <clears throat> this, uh, the arrow of the thaw, the uh, Khrushchev reforms, uh, some elements of Cezanism was already accepted again. Uh, it, and it was very strange. For example, the, the painting could be about revolutionary soldiers with the red banner. It could be workers uh, at the factory, uh, very proper subjects. But in the brush strokes, uh, it was okay to uh, allow yourself a little bit of Cezanne strokes. And this is exactly what these teachers who hated social realism, they could never say it aloud, but they were encouraging the students move back to uh, 
uh, <clears throat> to Cezanne. And uh, neither Alec nor uh, Vitalik uh, really wanted this. But for them, Cezanne lost all the interest because it was old already. Uh, if you want something old, they would rather paint uh, as, uh, as, as uh, I don't know, Rembrandt or whatever, but it should be really old, not, not uh, the modernism old. Um, uh, and um, uh, you remember that uh, Vitalik in the video said that what we created was a movement as a character. So in, in fact, it became the fourth character because, well, one character was uh, Melamid, the other character was Komar, the third camera, uh, character was Komar and Melamid as, as the third character. Now there was a fourth uh, character, movement as a character. And the first, maybe one of the first characters they created was the in in <clears throat> illiterate, uh, I mean illiterate uh, peasant uh, of the 18th century, uh, Apelles Zablov. And uh, the, the whole story was that uh, Apelles Zablov, uh, illiterate pe um, peasant invented in the 18th century abstract painting. And they created those uh, paintings for, for him. They created um, uh, the whole series. And there was a huge exhibition of the inventor uh, of uh, uh, abstract expressionism, illiterate peasant, 18th century, Apelia uh, the, the other character was even more interesting. It was uh, uh, the guy whose name was Bochumov. Uh, his story is even more dramatic. Uh, Bochumov was uh, a very serious realist. Uh, he was uh, fighting with uh, all the avant-garde artists because he believed that uh, realism is, is very good and uh, because it allows you to paint what you see. Uh, so this is truth. You, you see something and you paint it. And uh, the, his fight with uh, avant-garde artists sometimes were physical. In one of those physical fights, he lost uh, his um, left eye. Now, when you see the world with one eye, if you just close your left eye and, and see, you will always see the side of your nose. And as a real realist, Buchumov started painting, showing what he saw, which was a part of the nose. So you can see each landscape had his nose on, on the left. Um, Uh, now, as uh, uh, <clears throat> to continue the this theme of uh, missing body part, missing body parts, they uh, painted the whole series of portraits of world leaders uh, with the, in style of uh, Van Gogh with the. the one of the ear cut off. Uh, and uh, there, there were two um, kind of ideas uh, that merged uh, in, in this whole series. One was uh, the painter who cut off his uh, ear. And the, the other one was the uh, event that was happening at the same time when uh, Anwar Sadat uh, came to Israel, met with, with uh, Menachem Begin, and they signed uh, a, a peace agreement between Egypt and Israel, and it was revolutionary, it was very dramatic, um, and uh, both of them received Nobel Prize for Peace. And uh, uh, sadly, 
uh, the uh, 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 Muslims of uh, Egypt uh, eventually killed uh, Saddam, uh, <clears throat> killed uh, Anwar Sadat. Um, and so they uh, created this whole series uh, based on, on both events where all the leaders were kind of imitating uh, Van Gogh uh, and had their uh, one of the ears cut off. So a few days ago, I, I called Vitaly and I said, look, this is a great uh, painting uh, showing them off. Uh, it looks extremely dramatic, but what does it mean? I, I don't understand the meaning. And uh, Vitaly explained, she said, we never uh, had any uh, literal uh, li literal meaning. So we, it's not an a, a allegory. It's not. It's just the image that was created by the combination of the events. And uh, <clears throat> you can interpret it any way you want. You can interpret it as the inability for the world leaders to hear one another. That's why uh, one uh, ear is missing. Or or you can uh, have your own interpretation and your interpretation will be as valid as my interpretation or no interpretation at all. Uh, so um, I, I encourage uh, everybody to uh, try to figure out what uh, uh, they had in mind because th they don't know and maybe we, we could figure it out. Um, and uh, this is uh, probably uh, where I should stop and um, I am ready to answer any questions as you guys may have. I, I will stop sharing now uh, and we we can talk. Yes, thank you, uh, Vladimir, for uh, for this uh, insightful remarks. And uh, we now have a special guest for our uh, ask Q and A part, uh, Vitaly Komar. And so we can have uh, now a little bit of a discussion and a, a conversation um, about uh, you know. The, um, what was sa said and some more insights uh, in the times uh, that you all witnessed. Um, and so uh, we are inviting the audience to ask questions. Please uh, do type your questions in the Q&A um, uh, section. And uh, in the meantime, um, I will um, ask um my first question um and uh, um that would be um uh, you know there according to some rumors um uh, you vladimir uh, somehow participated in the uh, creation of the term sorts art and other rumors says say that it's not quite so so i would uh, ask you to um comment on how the term was created were you what was your role in it and how how did it come to be i i, I will be happy to answer this question but then i would ask uh, vitaly to uh, yes confirm or deny uh, what i'm saying um uh, uh, well one one thing is is uh, uh, established uh, that uh, I was present when the name was discussed. Uh, uh, I, when I first um, walked into the, the studio where they had the first sorts art paintings, um, I, I said, um, well, this is uh, a real poor part. Uh, and uh, I would call it, uh, this is finally we have Soviet pop art, and this is uh, uh, incredible. Uh, 
uh, I never used. Uh, yes, yeah, I said uh, you have the Soviet, um, the Soviet pop art. Now, uh, uh, Alec, uh, I remember he was talking about uh, the filmmaker uh, Nina Zaretskaya, I can't remember her name, and on her was a documentary film. Uh, she had a documentary <laughs> film about uh, Sots Art, and uh, there uh, was Alec who said, uh, one, um, uh, Vadik Paperny came in and looked and said, hey guys, this is a uh, real Soviet pop art. And uh, he said, we uh, heard, heard something about pop art, but kind, kind of vaguely. Uh, and then, um, so there started the discussion, uh, shall we call it uh, uh, soft pop art, uh, uh, calm art, uh, now, um, com art, mostly communist uh, art, and uh, Vitalik will uh, confirm that Alec was strongly against uh, com art. He says that will be mean Kamar art. Uh, you're too clever. You want to, <laughs> to she, take. She told, she told that it's too much remind my name. Exactly. Um, and then. So I, I wasn't the inventor of the term Sots Art. I just said, uh, uh, congratulations, this is the first uh, Soviet version of pop art. And then uh, Alec and Vitalik uh, discussed it, uh, argued, and uh, came up uh, with the word Sots Art. Alec, uh, Vitalik, tell uh, I think, I think maybe, uh... Most of the uh, our auditorium uh, didn't uh, understand if you basic concept which united pop art, pop culture in the West, and propaganda popular culture in the East in Soviet Union. Um, I'm half of my life I'm working and living in New York City, and um, I understand that. Uh, so-calling uh, visual commercials, which inspire uh, pop art in, in, in the end of 50s and 60s, by structure very close to Soviet propaganda art. Um, because in both, in, in, we, can call, we can call socialist realism and Soviet propaganda art as a commercial of communist ideology. And we can call uh, Western commercials as a propaganda of consumerism. It's very similar uh, phenomena with working uh, uh, kitchen, let's say. Uh, mm, you know, in Stroganov Art Institute, uh, we never was taught by our teachers how to make slogans. Forward to final victory of communism or forward to... Um, mm, uh, our patriotism, etc., etc. That was the essence, conceptual essence of the propaganda art, so calling red banners with white letters and exclamation marks. Uh, Stroganov Art Institute didn't give us uh, experience. I got this experience in army because for, um, from the second year of education, I was taken to uh, army and they used me as an artist in army sport club. Uh, and that's place when I study Sots art. I studied real propaganda art in this place, uh, in this case. It was in uh, very uh, south part of Soviet Union, always the border was something like uh, Iran or uh, Turkey. I don't remember exactly. Uh, maybe Iran, yes, Iran, Iran, or Afghanistan, something like that. Um, I never studied anything how to be soldier, but they use me as an artist and um, all these um, uh, officers was very happy because they can really mm, uh, now make a good design of the sport club. Uh, it, uh, it was a Turkistansky uh, Vajenny Okrug. Uh, I was, uh, I spent a year 
there and came back after the to, uh, Stroganov Art Institute. Uh, it was a good life experience. Um, and uh, I think it's not coincidence that we started with kind of parody of the um, Soviet propaganda visual culture. Uh, and many people from the beginning don't understand that this is a just parody, uh, parody of the um, eclecticism of Soviet ideology, for example. Uh, we changed many different styles in, uh, in our collaboration uh, works. Uh, um, I tell you uh, that um, even Picasso, as you remember, changed style quite often. But he never did what we discovered. I believe uh, it was a really important movement. We start to make diptych and triptych from different styles. Uh, it's completely different idea that's mixture of two styles in one painting. For example, Russian icons of end of the uh, 19th century. There is a face that was depicted academically, realistically, but all in other details was in ancient uh, old Byzantine icon style. It's two styles in one painting. Or um, Russian avant-garde in period when he gradually became uh, socialist realism. They depict the faces as a realistic academy art and the all other details in Cuba futuristic style, which was close to Russian avant-garde. This is a Russian icon of end of 19th century in this transitional short period of um, mutation of avant-garde to uh, um, socialist realism was very simple Italy, um... and very eclectic at the same time but as a real uh, Russian version of Marxism was very eclectic. Uh, and um, we start to make diptych. Well, Picasso never made the diptych of one cubism. He never combined in diptych or triptych his cubism and his blue period or his neoclassicism. That's Comer Melanie did in 1973. It was a long polyptych of more than a few hundreds miniatures, uh, size of the slide uh, represent um, biography of our contemporary. It was very yes, important work. We had this wonderful work at the exhibition. Right. It was a, a true masterpiece. It was very popular. Everybody was uh, looking at these little squares with, with great interest and uh, admiration. Uh, so absolutely. And we have a question, you know, you were talking about propaganda. We, we have a um, question from the audience um, about the uh, contemporary uh, propaganda and whether you um, are thinking of responding in your work to uh, contemporary developments, uh, slogans such as you know, making America great again, and uh, and uh, whether whether you whether whether you um you, do have do you have any plans to employ any any contemporary politics in your um art, or are you more concerned about internal things like symbolism of uh, various um, uh, you know sources and such. Uh, you know, all my life I try to understand and appreciate some different point of views, which not exactly similar to my point of view. And I never try to make a discussion or about the test, because test, I believe, is the expression of freedom, personal freedom. Everybody has their own test and it's it's funny to discuss test uh, and that's one of the reason uh, i really love to change some subjects some, some works for example in 1973 we start to make a kind of very spiritual installation one of the first installation in um, soviet union uh, in um, circle of underground artists. Uh, we had uh, many names, uh, underground artists, uh, non-conformist artists, unofficial artists, alternative artists, dissident artists, many different names. Uh, and we create the kind of small pantheon of the 
um, funny depiction of the heroes of different religious, religions. Uh, because I believe the um, smile must be represented in all very serious uh, concept. A smile is a kind of, um, let's say, salt or pepper in some good uh, cooked food. It's, it's, we need it, uh, some a little small smile in everywhere. Sometimes it's hidden smiles. In this case, not everybody understood the parody. For example, our legendary biographies, Bochumov and Zyablov. Actually, uh, Bochumov was recognized from the first point of view because he lost his eye and he always depict on the left part of his painting his nose. And Zyablov was first abstraction, abstraction the slave artist um, who uh, invent abstract art but earlier than Kandinsky, earlier than another uh, heroes of the American Expressionism. Uh, but he was the first, uh, first pioneer of the art. And this is the two most famous, most important superstition among the artists. So good artists, people believe, must be easily recognized as his individual style. First, Bochumov, if you see the nose, that's Bochumov. It was a parody on this superstition, professional superstition. Second professional superstition, artist must be first who discovers something which nobody did before. Zyablov, you see the abstract painting with date. One, seven, 18th century, etc. Um, it's a parody of another superstition. You know, I really believe that art history, it's not the, you know, uh, kind of racing of horses. Uh, you know, if you late on the race of horse, uh, you can take the some uh, horse which lost one circle for the leader. Because sometimes the last horse for a few hours uh, going to be as a first, yes. uh, as a more visible uh, in head of the all others, uh, but yes. just because they lost one circle. Uh, anyway, uh, I think it's very important to understand that this the all sorts art is a parody, but very special parody, visual parody. It's remind me translation, you know. Uh, when we speak about art, we always translate something. We translate from visual language to uh, verbal language. It's very difficult for me, especially because I my English is not good and I have to make double translation. I translate it from visual to uh, verbal, after that to, from Russia to English, etc., etc. But anyway, it's a quite funny game and I'm happy yes. with the results. Thank you, Vitaly. We have, I think, uh, two more questions. One from uh, Vladimir and one from the audience. Um, I, I want to ask uh, Vitaly a, a question. I, I have uh, one idea about Swartz Art and I want to ex express and I would like you to comment. Do you agree with what I say or not? Uh, to me, the most important thing about uh, Swartz Art is laughter. Uh, now, I just remember my first reaction when I saw the, the first Sots Art works and all my friends who saw um, Sots Art work, we all were laughing like crazy. It was so funny. It, uh, it was so funny. I said smile. And, and uh, my idea is uh, in the demise of the Soviet Union and the collapse of the Soviet Union, Sots Art played a very important role because as my uh, late friend Maya Turovska uh, used to say, laughter is irreverent to any dogma. And uh, as soon as you make some oppressive ideology funny, you kill it. Uh, nobody can take it seriously anymore. As soon as you start 
laughing at the slogans and the images. So, um, of course, uh, dissidents uh, played also a very important role, but uh, they they were fighters. They were very serious. And uh, uh, of course, uh, they were brave people. We all uh, admired the braveness and uh, their willingness to suffer, to lose their freedom, sometimes lose their life uh, fighting with the oppressive regime. But I don't think their struggle was as effective as laughter because nothing is stronger uh, to destroy a, a dogma than, than laughter. What do you think, Vitaly? As I said, all my life I try to understand and appreciate some different opinions. Uh, and uh, with you, I can agree, but partly, because I believe Sotsart, uh, of course, was a part of many different movements which remove um, Soviet Russia from uh, Soviet condition to kind of very special kind of capitalism of uh, South America type. Um, very corrupted capitalism, very corrupted democracy, um, and with totalitarian connection of secret police and uh, um, uh, criminal war. It's, um, it's not a it's not bring Russia to Western type of democracy. It brought it to Cuban type of um, uh, state, let's say, and another small um, countries in South America, where is also Catholicism, religious, very important and very um, close to um, uh, crime, etc., etc., uh, and in this case, I think, uh, thank you very much for appreciation of the role of Sotsar. But I believe Sotsar also responsible for very cynical eclecticism, cynicism of contemporary world, contemporary Soviet crime world. They're really laughing for everything. Everything part of the cynic smile. They don't believe nothing. It's a kind of archa it's very close to archaic kingdom of Europe uh, uh, before Renaissance. Uh, mm, Europe changed after Second War. Uh, many countries refused to have a colonies like Great Britain. Uh, idea of mm, idea of the human rights, idea of open openness of press, uh, idea of um, mm, um, politically corrected things, it became, we were witnesses of this. And Russia stopped on the 17th century development of very cynical um, and very adventurist type of the lifestyle. And Sotsart in some way was also kind of intellectual adventure with smile, with parody, etc. I can't say that I could change my life. I can't say that I hate my life, that I made something bad. No, I did what I did. Uh, and um, it's a part of very eclectic mosaic of the world. Problem is, problem of losing, we must to refuse to be aggressively disagree with any different point of view. That's the key of understanding What's, what's going on on the Western civilization and now more or less better turn into reality in the West Europe. Yes. In Russia, it's not happened, unfortunately. The uh, people very aggressively uh, take each other difference in religion, in um, ideology, in sense of humor, in their love and hate. Um, that's a big problem. That's unfortunately very, very, very true, Vitaly, yes. And we just can only hope that in the future it improves. But you were uh, mentioning, uh, you know, writers and uh, other dissidents. And we have a question from the audience um, about, you know, if, were there any influences uh, between 
you know, writers and um, art and well, whether uh, you were inspired by any writers and uh, vice versa as uh, source art creators? Uh, yes. In, in particular, uh, in particular, uh, the person asks about Mikhail Bulgakov, um, uh, but uh, I don't know, were, were he of any influence of any other uh, really literally figures who were uh, influential for you? Uh, I was under uh, strong influence of Bakhtin because he understood the revolution of course, by censorship, he couldn't express this concept very clear, but it's under underlines. That's uh, all this carnival of avant-garde of revolution. It was a real Saturna, Saturnalist game. It was an ancient tradition when in the end of carnival, the hero and king of carnival was killed by people. Uh, it, it was a bloody carnival, all this avant-garde revolution and first years of the civil war. And that's, he understood that's how it's a bloody laughing. Because carnival people always laughing and laughing and laughing and killing each other in the end of this. Saturnale. Yeah. Thank you, Vitaly. And and so um, maybe to to um, conclude our uh, discussion, um, I would like to ask question to both of you. Um, so one of the seminal events for the um, nonconformist art is the bulldozer exhibition, which happened in 1974, and uh, this year, uh, 2024 marks. 50th anniversary since uh, the bulldozer exhibition. And uh, um, so I want to ask um, uh, both of you about, uh, you know, your um, kind of feelings and uh, my participation in or uh, understanding of bulldozer exhibition and how it uh, related to the, you know, the situation then. And now, 50 years later, um, we seem to be um, getting into um, similar um, situation uh, back in Russia. And uh, so I wanted to um, have your, your comments and your feelings in this respect. Maybe we'll start with Vladimir and then we can um, Vita conclude with Vitaly's remarks. Um. I think uh, the infamous bulldozer uh, exhibition was, uh, uh, not everybody will agree with me, but I think it was the great uh, event for the underground art because it immediately brought attention of the whole world to these artists. Nobody knew them uh, really. And all of a sudden, they were thrown into international uh, uh, stage. And uh, even though uh, some uh, nice paintings were destroyed by, by bulldozer, and I, I know Vitaly's uh, uh, few pieces were destroyed there, uh, but I think you gained more than you lost because it immediately um, has thrown the whole artistic stage of the Soviet Union into uh, international uh, space. Uh, I agree with that because uh, first publication about uh, Alex and my art uh, was after um, after bulldozer show, but actually not exactly. Uh, for example, the publication, first publication in New York Times was after um, uh, Alex and me was expelled from the youth section of Artist Union. Uh, it was an article by uh, uh, Henrik Smith, um, 
Pulitzer Prize winner as a journalist, and also a very uh, important magazine which dedicated purely to pure art is a Playboy uh, magazine published a big article about Comer and Melamed art. It was before bulldozers. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, uh, uh, after bulldozers, for example, we had a conversation with art critic of music came to Soviet Union to um, cover uh, the, this scandalous show um, destroyed by government. Uh, and um, it was, he also was not only art critic, also famous Douglas Davis, famous, um, one of the, um, one of the founder of the video art in the United States, a uh, wonderful person. Um, and uh, he came to New York, uh, he came to Moscow and we had a good dinner. He brought the um, old uh, melted uh, very good whiskey. We drink together and discuss that next year, 1975, first journey to American and Russian astronauts, cosmonauts to space. And I remember I proposed, let's do together. You are artists, we are artists. We'll make a first work of joint work of American and Russian artists. And we, we brought the bottle of vodka, regular, not very expensive vodka. We was very drunk and discuss all ideas. And as a result was kind of collage, where is the line between us? He, Douglas, made the photograph in New York. We made the photographs in Moscow and combine them, uh, make a kind of collage uh, with many different parts related to national holidays of Russia and Soviet Union uh, and uh, US and SU. Um, and finally, this work in Metropolitan Museum, it was owned by Metropolitan Museum, this piece. Uh, and also um, Douglas Davis was an artist in Feldman Gallery. Feldman Gallery was a very important gallery representing the Orhol. And through the Douglas Davis, Feldman made our first show in 1976. It was all works were smuggled out from Russia by our friends who left to Israel, etc., immigrated to Israel and took a few hour works with them. Uh, it was a very important show in 1976, first show on the West of Comer and Melamed, uh, thanks to Douglas Davis, thanks to, to um, uh, our friends like Alex Goldfarb, who helped to smuggling out these works. Uh, and first article, important article, not just like Playboy article, appear in uh, Western play, Western, pre, Western press about Comer and Melamed art. It was a um, um, Umberto Eco. He published a big article when particularly dedicated to a few reproduction of this biography of our contemporaries. Uh, actually, it could be nice to translate it, um, translation of this article to published in this catalog of uh, show which was but unfortunately, good, хорошая мысля приходит опосле. But it's very important because Umberto Eco is one of the most important critics. The critic of such a scale later also um, cover uh, our uh, project in collaboration with Paul Company, in collaboration with Masses, People Choice. It's the Arthur Dante. It was our la last work in collaboration. Um, that's, uh, that's, I believe, a lot of things to remember. Yes. Thank you so much, Vitaly. Thank you very much, uh, Vladimir. Um, it was a, yes, wonderful panel. And uh, I hope uh, Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And, and, and my, my pleasure, my, my pleasure seeing you. And thank you uh, so really much enjoy, for your uh, uh, Thank you, Julie. presentation. I really enjoyed it. Vladik, it was great. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yes. So did I. Thank you so much. And bye-bye. Uh, uh, have, a, have a good evening. And uh, um, I hope to see you at our events again.